Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Nashville, Tennessee, where we're covering the Army Aviation Association of America's annual conference and trade show, the number one gathering of U.S. Army aviators and indeed Army aviators from around the world gathering here to meet with industry, thought leaders, media, and more. Our coverage here is sponsored by Bell uh, and Leonardo DRS, and we're here on the L3 stand, one of our other uh, sponsors, uh, to talk to uh, Luca uh, Savoy, uh, who is uh, a, uh, a former uh, U.S. Air Force major, AC-130 uh, gunship, a special uh, operator uh, uh, with 3,000 hours under your belt, uh, who is now the, the president of the surveillance and strike systems sector, the S3 in the L3. Uh, sir, uh, great seeing you. Great seeing you too. Pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the Army's um, aviation modernization plan. It's on the forefront uh, of uh, almost every conversation we're having here. Uh, and the Army has been looking at each one of its Cape Sets, uh, Cape Set 1, Cape Set 2, Cape Set 3. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, the V-280 and the Defiant are in the Cape Set 3 part. Cape Set 1 is the Raider, which is uh, the Sikorsky-Lockheed team uh, that are working that. Lockheed also has partnered uh, with uh, Boeing on uh, the Defiant uh, part of it. Everybody is cooperating and partnering with everybody else because I think Bell is also, uh, you know, partnered with Lockheed. But talk to, us, talk to us a little bit, you know, a little bit less of a focus is the partnership that you guys have with AVX to bring your own Cape Set 1 uh, competitor uh, to the fore. Talk to us, Luke, a little bit about the capabilities and your guys' proposal. No, absolutely. I mean, I think one, it's important to see what the Futures Command is trying to do. They're out there doing very non-traditional acquisitions, specifically launching that um, with the first First Cape set, Farah, the future uh, attack reconnaissance aircraft, and really AVX, which has been involved in the JMRTD from a design perspective, primarily on rotors and gearboxes, and us who come to do the you know with the systems perspective, a platform perspective, you know really the marriage of those two teams who are really non-traditional. Our work with futures on EMBGB. Um, and then our work with Army Aviation on FUA and other things as well really and, and brings if you could, those together. And if you could explain those uh, those acronyms to our uh, uh, audience, it would be great. The Army Aviator types will be fine with it. Everybody else might go, what the heck was Luke talking about? No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, so with the Futures Command, they have a new uh, NVG, night vision goggle program, that has augmented reality in it, uh, a white phosphorus. We're really the lead program for Futures for delivering that this year, which really showed how non-traditional acquisition could wrap rapidly create just generation leaping types of capability into the field. We're bringing that exact same culture and mindset with a, another group, AVX, who's very, very like-minded as us. Out of the box thinking, non-traditional supply chain, non-traditional design ment mentality, and that's really what's bringing our coaxial compound, compound helicopter to reality as part of the, the, the FARA proposal. And, and so why do you guys think you know, you've got the edge in this? Obviously the compound uh, coaxial idea is what's really in the fore. We see that also in the Raider design, uh, mirrored also in, in its bigger brother, uh, you could argue the, the Defiant. What do you see as the great attribute to this uh, setup, which you know has a lot of moving parts to it, right? I mean, there's some aviators who look at it and they go, "Wow, you know, it was one thing to have four, uh, you know, eight blades uh, turning, whereas you've got a lot more going on here." Yeah, I mean, actually, the the design concept on the coaxial side is actually not something new. It's actually when you're trying to get into a condensed footprint, that's a key thing. But we like to say we're faster, lighter, more agile, lethal, longer, longer uh, endurance. Really, when you bring a lightweight uh, capability with using the ITEP engine that the Army has supplied with our very, very small footprint system, and then you bring that systems approach to the entire thing, and then also starting with the mission. A lot of us are all prior aviators who are involved in this, and we really start with the mission and work back through the requirements, and that really shows itself in the design. A lot of us have a lot of lessons on why certain seating arrangements are good, why the gun placement is good, why the rotor system for sustainability and performance is important. And I think all those lead to a faster system, a more lethal system, and one that can stay on station longer than anything else out there. Um, and uh, Cape Set 1 has a 30-foot uh, circle diameter, if I'm 40 correct? 40-foot. 40 40-foot, excuse me, 30-foot would have been a little bit too teeny-weeny. Uh, but um, talk to us about the, the overall attributes. Why do you think your aircraft is, is better suited than the other ones? Well, uh, so uh, one, we're in the middle still of a down select. So uh, hopefully uh, the Army will make an announcement here shortly on who the down selectees are. So I won't go into uh, all the unique discriminators and specifics, um, but the reality really comes down to that the smaller the footprint, the better, and the faster you can go, the better. And we believe that we, we meet or exceed every requirement that is out there that the Army has laid forward. 
Um, a part of this uh, uh, in, will involve uh, uh, flying uh, the airplanes. How far away are you guys from actually flying, uh, uh, flying an airplane? So we, we have the schedule laid out for, for the government. Um, we have a, uh, uh, when we'll induct the first fuselage um, at our production facility that we'll be doing the prototype activities at. And then as laid out by the Army, we'll meet the Army's schedule, which is first flight in 42 months. Um, which, is, which is pretty aggressive, right? I mean, if you look at it, um, the Army has talked about Cape Set 3 in 2028, and though, though that airplane is, or one, both of the airplanes are now flying on that. Um, from your standpoint, are you guys going to be able to attain such an aggressive schedule? Absolutely. Um, and, and a lot of that is, you know, not waiting uh, for different milestones and for the government to catch up. Um, we're, we're in this uh, to, to, to win it, and, uh, and we're full speed ahead right now in, in making this thing a reality. Um, let me uh, ask you a little bit about the challenge. You know, the, the Army is asking every one of the teams here to make an investment. But one of the challenges and concerns appears to be, um, you know, for example, Boeing invested in the Block 2 model of the Chinook, for example, and the Army has decided it's not going to buy any more of those aside from equipping uh, the 160th with it, which, which makes a lot of sense. But if you look at that overall lift requirement, you know, folks are looking at this saying, wait a minute, you know, a couple of years ago, the number one thing was lift uh, and maybe moving ahead more quickly with Cape Set 3. And now it's like, well, no, 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 you know, we need, we need the Kiowa replacement. And we haven't had Kiowas in the force. The Apaches have sort of adapted to that mission. So talk to us a little bit, you know, do you guys have certainty that the Army has actually thought through its plans as you're getting ready and making like this kind of investment, that the Army really is, 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 is thinking clearly enough as it goes through doing this so that you don't end up investing with something that next year maybe is no longer a requirement? I think the Army has really thought about this more so than they had in any other acquisition. I think they've looked at the modeling of what the threat is out there, and I think the threat and the potential you know, areas of operations and the types of, types of adversaries that we will engage have led to a, you know, we've been doing a coin you know, counterinsurgency type of war, counterterrorism war here for the last 20 years. And the reality is, is when the Army looks at what the Army specifically needs versus what the Joint Force needs, I think FARA is what they need. They need the attack, reconnaissance type of aircraft to get out in front of the leading edge of troops, assist in the, the number one priority of the Army, which is long range precision fires, and assist and make that even more lethal and further and further into the enemy territory. And then there's the lift component of that. But I think if you look at the Army's FIDEP, what they just submitted in the FIDEP, they've looked at doing both simultaneously, both Cape Set, Cape Set 3 and Cape Set 1. So I think the Army has truly, truly really looked at both the threat and the sustainment trail and the longevity of the fleet that they had and really prioritized it correctly to, to basically do both, but lead from an acquisition perspective with the smaller aircraft and prove out the methodology that we're using and accelerate it because the JMRTD really brought Cape Set 3 very, very far along the road already. So it's already a much more mature requirement. Um, once, once upon a time though, some of, uh, you know, a Kiowa for example would be fairly alone. Now you have many, many layers of overhead assets. Um, L3 is in the business of those overhead assets as well, both on the manned and unmanned side of the equation. How does this integrate how does this man platform integrate? Because I was talking with, you know, a, a former scout helicopter guy who was saying, look, I'm, I'm not sure even that requirement is as valid as it used to be a long time ago because that really, you know, we're evolving so many overhead layers that there are a lot of different ways to try to do this mission. How do you integrate this with the rest of that aviation infrastructure that the Army has built, particularly over the last couple of decades, that has fundamentally changed how it does the scouting, reconnaissance, and surveillance missions? So I think L3 has been at the forefront of that already, specifically the one you, the man-on-man -man teaming side of things that we have enabled the Apache with. I think we bring the exact same things when we look at mission architecture, we look at system architecture on any of the CAPE sets, but the CAPE set one in particular, we look at, hey, we already know how to integrate those layers. We're a prime on some of those layers. We're a prime on the components of those layers. We know the architecture is better than anyone. You can guarantee that our offering on FARA already looks at the current architectures and how to integrate them and the future ones. Um, and having those being just things that, that scale to the nth degree without affecting your size, weight, and power on the platform. Uh, all right, now I have to uh, ask you, you flew uh, one of the most iconic and, and coolest airplanes uh, on the planet, the AC-130 uh, gunship. Uh, the only uh, airplane that has a gun sight on the left side of the, uh, left side of the airplane. Talk to, and you also flew the U-28, which is an airplane that actually nobody knows anything about, uh, actually. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about what it's like flying. You were a veteran of uh, Fallujah 1, uh, which was uh, everybody on the ground. I had friends who were very, very thankful for uh, the overhead support that, uh, that 
all, all parts of the joint force we're giving, but especially the gunships because of the precision you guys bring to it. Talk to us a little bit about um, the extraordinary mission uh, of this, uh, you know, fairly quiet community within uh, within the special operations community. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, gunships are uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I love flying AC-130s, and I love working on the next generation. So uh, I, right now I do work on the AC-130 Whiskey, the AC-130J, which takes, you know, just having the guns on the side to now incorporating, you know, standoff precision engagement munitions, um, low collateral damage munitions, um, small diameter bombs. So, you know, right now we have a much more uh, wider array of uh, munitions on the platform. And by the way, we're doing it with half the crew. Um, and those are the enabling technologies at L3 that we're enabling on that to really do twice as much with half as many people on the next generation of aircraft. And uh, talk to us about what it's like to fly an airplane that has um, multiple different calibers of guns going off all at the same time, including 105 mm -hmm. millimeter. Yeah, I like, to, like, like, I like to tell people on FAIR when we talk about the gun uh, and the integration around that. I was involved in the 30 mic mic integration on the AC-130 Whiskey. Um, and it's, it's, it's a joy to fly, and ironically, the 105 uh, moves the, the airplane the least amount. It's actually the 25 millimeter Gatling on the nose. That's the thing that pushes the airplane the most. So, uh, but uh, no, it's, it's great, especially when you're putting the hurt on the enemy. Uh, that's fantastic. And on uh, the U-28, uh, for our audience who doesn't know anything uh, about the U-28, because you said like most people have absolutely no idea what you say, tell everybody what the U-28 did, did and why it's so freaking cool. Um, well, it was classified for quite a, for quite a while, but uh, it's a multi-mission aircraft based on the Pilatus PC-12. Um, uh, surveillance capability uh, on a multi-int scale, um, but once again, with uh, with a very small crew, um, it does a tremendous amount with multiple sensors on on the platform, multiple capabilities, um, and, and a very very low cost per flight hour. Our last cost was like three hundred and thirty dollars a flight hour, and they just passed a half million hours uh, this past year. So. So 500,000 hours in an aircraft that's only been around since 2006. Uh, and it's it's pretty cool, the things with propellers are, are still pretty cool and flying out and doing the job every day. It most certainly is, most certainly is. Sir, thanks very much, Luke, really appreciate it. From uh, S3 of L3, uh, really appreciate it. Best of luck on the program. Thank you, appreciate it.